Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. In this video, I'm going to be planting a lot of perennial plants uh, that require sunlight. Uh, I've put up a video already uh, on shade perennials. Uh, I'll link that up here in the corner if you're interested in that. But there are a lot of um, spaces that I'm trying to fill in that have been annuals uh, for the last uh, couple years. There's a space in the back where I extended uh, so I could pull the annuals forward and put a row of perennials in. But most of these things are going to be things that go dormant in the winter and come back up the following spring. Some of them stay um, evergreen. The first thing that's going in is a uh, pineapple lily, and it's going to go in right at the entrance um, as, you come, uh, as you come off the uh, road and step up on this uh, little stone sidewalk. Uh, this variety is called Sparkling Burgundy. These are hardy in zone 7 to 10, um, and you uh, see them fairly frequently. Um, they bloom later in the summer with a spiky flower up about that tall or so. And if you're following along with the channel, you'll see it flower. Hopefully this year uh, it will flower. And again, it's going in right here on the, uh, on the corner. This is pretty easy digging out here at this point. This was actually a Plant Delights uh, introduction. Uh, way back when it's a very it's a pretty popular variety i see these in a lot i see these in a lot of landscapes around my area here in raleigh north carolina but we're gonna pop them in the ground leave it elevated just a bit and then i'll use mulch to uh take up the rest of that take up the rest of that space and it'll get watered in later so one pineapple lily in the ground let's move along i have a salvia going in uh, against the fence uh, called Jean's Jewel. This one is uh, zone 8A to 10 hardy, and technically I'm in zone 7B, but I'm in the city. It's out here by the road. Uh, this, um, I've got a pr good protected space for it. Most of the zone 8A perennials have come back reliably uh, the first couple seasons doing this uh, landscape job. I'm trying to get a few things um, that come up big and tall against the fence, but don't block the fence completely. Uh, similar to how this verbena banariensis is doing. So this one's gonna go right back here along the, uh, the back edge of the fence. And I'm not gonna show you me, show you planting uh, all of these. <laughs> They're quick and easy to put in the ground though because I try to buy most of these in little pint or quart pots. Some of them came from big bloomers. Uh, some of them came from plant delights. Some of them have been shared from other gardeners. We'll see that uh, throughout this video. Uh, but this will be the last one that I put in the ground on the video. We can just uh, walk through and talk uh, talk about the plants individually after this. I do break the roots up on them if they're root bound. And uh, this salvia will be super, super hardy. Uh, right up against this fence. These will grow much as four feet in a single a single season and uh, bloom all summer. That'll be the, one of the pollinators' favorites out here by the road. I found this western sunflower uh, in a quart pot. Uh, this is a helianthus that's native to the western part of the country. They're deer resistant, um, heat tolerant, tolerant of clay soils, really kind of rugged uh, plants. Most of these helianthus will bloom mid to late summer. It's going to go down back here on the uh, edge of the fence. And uh, again, um, you know, with all of these things that you're going to see in this video, um, a couple of them might have flowers now, but for the most part, these are summer flowering uh, hardy perennials. Um, this one's hardy in zone four to eight. A lot of you watching can actually uh, grow this um, western uh, helianthus or western sunflower. Um, and if you're following along with the channel, you can see it flower later this summer. A lot of what I'm trying to accomplish here uh, on some of these are just ground covers. And they're taking up space, hopefully preventing some weeds. Uh, lessening the amount of mulch I'm having to use uh, in this landscape. Uh, this sedum, uh, this is a variegated uh, sedum. Uh, there are lots of sedums uh, in this landscape. There's one here that's uh, in the process of in, in, is blooming right now. Um, and again, I could probably do a sedum tour by the time I finish planting the uh, the ones that are going in now, plus the ones that are already in the ground here. There's so many fantastic varieties, but these. Uh, the one thing that gets these uh, sedum is winter wet. So try to put them in places, you know, this one's planted up against a rock. Uh, this one over here will be planted up against a, a stone path that drains well down to the street. So uh, make sure they're gonna be dry in the winter time and you'll have a lot of success with these, uh, any of these stone crop, these ground cover sedum. Here's another sedum going in. This is sedum decephylum. This one actually blooms white. Uh, I think most of the ones I have in the ground at this point uh, bloom 
uh, yellow. This one's only hardy in seven to 10, but there are much hardier uh, ground cover sedums that you can be on the lookout for. I've got a stone uh, section up here by this uh, front fence that's gonna be planted next to. And again, these are just taking up uh, space on the ground. They will flower. They're, they're just super interesting and um, less weeding and less mulching. Here's another sedum called Lime Twister. And amazingly, this one's hardy all the way up to zone four. So I think the first one that I showed you was hardy to zone six. The last one was zone seven. This one is, is zone four to nine. It's kind of got a two-tone uh, gold and green um, variegation. And uh, it actually blooms pink. And again, I'm planting most of these sedum up in little, you know, little stone outcroppings that I've made. Incredibly drought tolerant, rabbit resistant, deer resistant. Uh, just great plants for the landscape. Here's another salvia, and you're gonna see quite a few salvias. Um, I, I do love them because they're deer resistant and rabbit resistant and you know, so pollinator friendly. Uh, this one is called Misty. Uh, this is a zone seven to 10 uh, perennial, and uh, it's, a more, it's very compact. Uh, and you can actually see that in this little container. Most of the other um, uh, salvias that you'll see will be a bit more stretched, you know, where they've been growing close together in a, in a, in a, in a, in a tray, you know, where they've been racing for light, but you can see just how much more compact uh, this variety is, and it's going right um, along a sidewalk. Found a four pack of platycodon or uh, balloon flowers. Uh, these are hardy. Most everybody watching can grow these. I think they're hardy in zone um, four to nine, but I'm going to plant a cluster of them uh, behind this uh, annual bed. Uh, uh, so ex excited about those. Um, and right next to that, uh, I've got a uh, salvia called Mulberry Jam, and this one can get pretty good size. I um, accidentally did this one in last year by overplanting a couple of other things that uh, were on it, but it did have a few flowers on it before, <laughs> before, before it was done in by other things uh, being too close to it. And the uh, hummingbirds were out here every afternoon on this one. This one is a uh, super super popular it'll get some size on it you know this year it'll, it'll it'll get up in this in this size range this one this one's hardy in zone 7b to 10 so it should come back reliably again um i let other things lay on top of it and uh, so but i'm excited to have excited to have found a new one I have a cone flower called trace amigos and it actually uh, kind of the flower color kind of changes colors um, as it matures it starts out kind of a peach color and goes orangey and then kind of a burgundy uh finish on it uh, I've also got some powwow white uh, echinacea that I found in a uh, four pack. Uh, and th those are gonna go together uh, back in this area. Uh, great thing about cone flowers is they're also resistant to most, um, uh, you know, to, to deer. Uh, they're drought tolerant, they're native. Uh, a, lot of a lot of positive things going for them. You can deadhead your cone flowers and, and get more flowers out of them. But I actually like, I actually prefer, I have a lot of cone flowers planted in this landscape and I prefer to actually leave the flowers, let them mature and let the birds get the seeds uh, rather than uh, deadheading them. But that, the, the choice you can make, you know, you can, you can get more flowers out of them by, by deadheading them. But again, um, I, would, I have so many flowering things out here, I prefer that the, uh, the birds have the opportunity to get those seeds. Down at Big Bloomers, I actually found a four pack of Gara. This is a white. Uh, flowering gara that are going to be planted again back behind this uh, annual border and you'll see that in the back garden uh, as well. Uh, again another perennial that definitely likes the well-drained soils. You'll see these not return if they're wet uh, during the uh, winter time and, um, and can kind of appear to be short-lived honestly if they um, and, and need to be replanted over and over but they tend to be um, if you have well-drained soil great perennial of course pollinators absolutely uh, love them. Next to it is a uh, statues. Uh, this variety uh, is called Humello. Uh, this was perennial plant of the year in 2019. And I said during the uh, shade video that I might try to go out and collect all of the perennial plants of the year. Uh, this is in the lamb's ear uh, family, uh, pink spiky flowers on this one and uh, absolute pollinator magnet and another one that deer uh, um, and rabbits tend to avoid as well. Uh, again, and this is another one. Um, anything in this group of plants is going to want uh, kind of well-drained uh, soil. So uh, this area stays moist, but it's definitely, it drains extremely well. And so uh, keep that in mind if you're picking a spot for these. Um, this is another one of those probably going to do really well in like your hell strip or a, a tough area in your landscape. 
One last thing going behind this annual border in the uh, front garden is a uh, Mexican salvia, and this one can get quite large over the course of the summer. Uh, I have a gold uh, variety of this that came back. This one's marginally hardy in my area. Any marginally hardy plant uh, that you're planting, so this is in a zone eight uh, perennial or eight B perennial, uh, putting it in in the spring, establishing it, getting it as big as possible in this first season, uh, is is definitely the ticket to have it coming back the next year. I wouldn't if I planted this late summer, almost certainly it wouldn't come back. These bloom pretty late uh, in the summer. This Mexican native uh, salvias, they're deer resistant, rabbit resistant, uh, and fantastic for the pollinators. This one is called emerald and cream. Uh, so uh, can't wait to see it grow this summer. I found a four pack of Black Eyed Susans. This is Goldstrom. This is another perennial plant of the year. This was 1999. Uh, perennial plant of the year. Uh, great gold flowers. I will tell you the rabbits um, um, will, uh, <laughs> they like black eyed Susans as much as we do, uh, I feel like. Uh, but these uh, will get yellow flowers on them, um, look great against this uh, highlights uh, Cameociferous uh, that's behind it, and uh, uh, pretty easy to grow. Another one I think kind of needs uh, well, you know, well drained soil, so it's going to go on a slope. Uh, uh, right here in the uh, front garden. I've got a four pack of Agastache called Golden Jubilee. This one has a goldish uh, foliage and then it has blue flowers. Uh, most people watching can grow um, most uh, Agastache varieties. This is another one of those that has the smelly foliage like the salvia. So the, the rabbits aren't gonna mess with it. The deer aren't gonna mess with them. Pollinators absolutely go crazy for almost any uh, Agastache. This uh, Golden Jubilee variety, because it has that gold foliage, would prefer a little more dappled uh, light. It needs sunlight, um, but uh, part shade conditions are best. The four of those are going into this area. And uh, my experience with Agastache is similar to some of these other perennials. When they go to sleep in the winter, they don't want to be wet. And so an area that's well drained is probably uh, ideal for these. Uh, and then behind it, uh, I've got a salvia called Amistad. This is a zone eight to 10 uh, perennial. Again, I'm in zone seven B here, but if I get this thing spring planted, get it well established out here by the road and this fence should be fine. Well, the flower should be right above uh, the fence here. Um, this one's kind of a, uh, a bluish purple uh, color. And uh, again, um, these are out here for the, uh, you know, for out here for the pollinators and especially the hummingbirds. Uh, and again, uh, I will, uh, you can cut these salvia in half. This is something I haven't said. Um, all of the salvia varieties in this landscape, uh, you can let them, they'll come up and bloom like mad in June and July, and then they tend to slow down a bit. I'll come out and cut them in half and get them to rejuvenate and uh, put on a full flower again. But I don't do them all at the same time, and that way I can keep the uh, pollinators happy, keep everybody happy. Uh, I'll take about a third of them and cut them in half, and then another third and another third about a week apart. But that's how I go about keeping the salvia blooming heavily all season and not end up stretching four or five feet and, and getting floppy in the landscape. Next up is, surprise, surprise, another salvia. Uh, this one's called Skyscraper. This one's hardy in zone seven to 10. One thing I'll say about, um, you know, I've got salvia in this landscape that are hardy up to zone four or five, so everybody watching can find uh, salvias to grow. I would consider if you're in zone five or six growing some of these um, uh, salvia that won't be perennial for you as annuals because they they will outperform many many of the other annuals that you would purchase. So if you're you know you're you're looking at you know petunias or zinnias or cosmos or any of those things uh, in, almost any of these salvias used as an annual is going to outperform those as an annual. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, I think I think they're worth using as annuals, uh, even if they don't come back for you. Uh, this skyscraper has a, a, a kind of a coral color. The tag says orange, but it's definitely some like a coral color. It's going to look great with the various annuals that have been planted uh, in this annual bed, and it's going in right here along uh, the edge of this entryway uh, sidewalk. Bulbs are in the process of dying back, so this salvia will just cover those up uh, very very quickly. When I'm planting one like this, when it goes in the ground, I probably will go ahead and take these flowers off. They came out of a greenhouse. Typically it's June um, when most of these start flowering. So this is a little early. I'd like to get the roots established a little more on it and uh, pruning it back will help with that. This is an interesting little Veronica called Trahane. Uh, most Veronicas 
get a little bit taller than this one. This one's great for uh, rock gardens. Uh, the, it has little blue flower spikes, almost like an ajuga um, sort of height to them. Uh, most Veronicas are going to need full sun uh, because of the gold foliage. This will be kind of a theme. If something has lighter goldish foliage, it would it would probably like a little bit of afternoon shade. So the area that I'm putting it in here will get some full sun on it, enough to keep the gold color on it, enough to get the flowers on it, uh, but uh, it will be protected by late afternoon. And it's just going to go behind a rock and just be allowed to uh, take whatever space it wants to take here. Little blue flower spikes in the summer, they're great for pollinators. Have several varieties of milkweed uh, in the landscape. Uh, the uh, butterflies lay their eggs on them later in the season. They also have beautiful flowers uh, that uh, attract pollinators into the landscape. It's good to have not only flowering things, but also the host plants uh, as well. And uh, there are a lot of herbs that qualify for that. Um, if you follow along with the channel, you can see lots of those in this landscape. I do most of my milkweed from seed. You can do um, swamp milkweed, Asclepias tuberosa, uh, from seed. Uh, this is a variety called uh, Hello Yellow. It's actually a uh, yellow flowering variety. This one can reach probably three feet in height. It's going to go back um, in this space and uh, again it'll bloom for weeks and weeks and then eventually hopefully um, some butterfly will come along and lay its eggs on it and uh, d almost devour it. It looks like the plant's being destroyed and then the next year it comes back incredibly vigorous again. I got a four pack of Salvia nemorosa. This one's called uh, Swifty Violet. Got several uh, Salvia nemorosas in the landscape. These tend to be the earliest flowering uh, salvias in my landscape. Um, they can bloom you know, almost weeks before our last, our, our frost free date, uh, actually. They tend to put on their biggest show for us here in the south uh, in the uh, spring, and then they'll repeat flower uh, into the fall, but again, um, uh, mainly for earlier. I've got other salvias that tend to be more in full bloom in the in the heat of the summer but they're hardy for almost everybody watching like zones three to nine got a four pack of these they won't all go here uh they'll be scattered along the back of this uh, what is becoming a little perennial border in front of some shrubs I, if you've been following along with the channel i moved this grass forward uh a few weeks ago and the annuals are here and i've got this little band along here that's going to become uh, perennial plants, most of the, which will go to sleep in the winter, come back in the spring, and then I've got some evergreen shrubs uh, behind those. Next to that uh, going uh, is a David Phlox. This is a, a white, fragrant, uh, upright Phlox that um, was perennial plant of the year in 2002. And again, I think I might, might go back and collect all the uh, perennial plants of the year just just for fun of just for the fun of it because I have so many of them in the landscape already. David's a great variety. I grew this one for years uh, at my nursery. It's a uh, very mildew resistant, very reliable uh, flowering upright Phlox. Moving along this new perennial border here, I'm putting in an Amsonia. I don't have any Amsonia in the uh, landscape so far. Uh, they have this bluish flowers in the spring, typically. Uh, this one's called Blue Ice, and it gets a gold fall uh, coloration as well. Uh, great uh, hardy perennials. Uh, they, they do spread by rhizome, but slowly, so they won't take over a giant space uh, very quickly. But uh, uh, this one uh, tends to bloom a little bit later in the spring. I've got some... Um, Put up a video from uh, uh, from Jeremy's uh, rock garden a few weeks ago, and his Amsonia were already his his varieties were already in absolute full bloom. So, uh, looking forward to the first Amsonia in this landscape. Uh, here's a, a, a Salvia gregii um, called Mirage Violet. It already has the uh, dark purple flowers on it. Um, the gregii tend to bloom very very early here as well, and then they can actually be cut back, and you can get them to just come on in full full-on repeat flower as well. And then uh, another Phlox. Uh, this one has a uh, purple new foliage on it. Uh, it's called Lord Clayton. Uh, the new, when, it, when it's actively growing, the foliage is this dark purple. It will green up in time and then it has a pinkish red flower. Another mildew resistant uh, upright Phlox uh, selection. Next up is a Verbascum uh, called Sugar Plum. These will get little pink uh, flower spikes on them late spring and in, in through the entire summer, this one, uh, this particular um, selection is one that will repeat bloom uh, throughout the uh, summer. Uh, and another just great plant for uh, pollinators. Uh, and next to it is another Salvia nemorosa. This is a, a white variety uh, called Salute White. And again, this one's flowering already. You can see these are very, very early uh, flowering. And, you know, it's going to come into full flower back here. Uh, you know, about 
just right after these azaleas are uh, each year, bloom for a long time, and then I'm going to have this annual border in front that will kind of take over uh, as it slows down a bit. And I can deadhead, you can deadhead these um, flower spikes as they finish up and you'll get some new, new growth and uh, new flowers. Several of the plants that are going in uh, were gifted uh, by others, and uh, this one was from uh, Ram's Beautiful Garden down in Athens, Georgia. This is a bee balm. Uh, that's going into this spot and uh, uh, should be perfect. I've got a couple other bee bombs that are coming up a little further down the line, coming back uh, from last year. Native, uh, pretty easy to uh, pretty easy to grow uh, plants that, of course, the pollinators absolutely go crazy for. Um, some are mildew resistant, some aren't. Some newer selections, so you know, keep that in mind as you're shopping for bee bomb. There are improved uh, varieties out there. This is Moody Blues Dark Pink uh, Veronica. And uh, rather than uh, run my mouth about it, I can come over here and show you the Moody Blues uh, purple uh, right here. And you can see how, what a great perennial this is. It's already flowering. See how compact it is? Uh, the one over there is just a pink uh, version of this. These, this is about as tall as this one's gotten over the two years it's been in this spot. And it's fuller, bigger, better, fuller each year it comes up. Blooms like this pretty much all summer long. It can be deadheaded to increase the flowering, but you'll see you get, you get one flower spike like this, and then it just gets side branches that continue to uh, bloom all summer. Po absolute pollinator favorite. I got a four pack of Lobelia. This is a Queen Victoria Cardinal flower. Has the uh, just incredible purple foliage on them. It'll get the red, scarlet colored flower spikes on them about 30, 36 inches tall during the summer. This is a native from Canada down through the southeast, and I, I think even over to the uh, even over to the southwest. I was able to find this in a four pack, and they can just be uh, spread out along this uh, perennial border. But excited about these. I've got some other ground cover lobelia, some other types of lobelia in the landscape too. If you're following along with the channel that you can see during the summer, I'll wrap this up with some Achillea or yarrow. Uh, I actually have several other um, salvias and some agastache that came from uh, rams as well that are going in. And there's a ton of sun-loving perennials already in this landscape and part shade um, uh, or shade perennials in this landscape. So, and I I'm doing weekly tour videos here. If you want to uh, follow along, you can see, uh, see all of these things as they wake up, as they start blooming during the summertime. Uh, this is a uh, Parker's Gold. This is a four pack of yarrow. I've got a couple other varieties as well that are going in. There's a, a commercial landscape near me that has this beautiful field of gold uh, yarrow that uh, it just amazes me uh, every summer. So I'm just gonna cluster four of these yellows together um, in, the, in the landscape. It won't be that kind of show because you know this is a small, a small urban lot over here. Sometimes these won't bloom in the first year. Um, that's okay. Uh, they're hardy in zone three to 10. So everybody watching can grow Yarrow, the foliage is pungent, and usually that's a pretty good indicator that rabbits and, uh, and deer will leave them alone. Not always, <laughs> not always, but most of the time they'll leave these things that are pungent. And that's the, you know, the salvias and the agastache, any of these things that are, you know, if you rub the leaves and smell them, that they're pungent, um, usually they'll leave them alone. So there you go, uh, lots of uh, sun-loving uh, perennials going into this landscape. I will say that this landscape, other than a few places, um, is 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 sunny I, you know the sun that i get here in most spots in this yard is not more than about six hours of direct sun and even so even some of these full sun perennials they're getting what they need but they're not necessarily getting 15 hours a day and especially something like that lobelia that i showed just a minute ago uh i think six hours of direct sun is about the max that it, uh, that, that it wants anyway. So there you go. Thank you guys for following along. There was a shade uh, perennial video that went up uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday as you're seeing this. And so if you, want to, if you have a shade garden, maybe that video is for you. Thanks for watching.